I've spent a sizable portion of my YouTube career lamenting the use of low floor trams on rapid transit style lines, from Seattle to Ottawa to Toronto. Of course, now that these lines have actually been built, complaining about the platforms isn't going to help much. And given that in all three cases, these transit lines have the potential and will hopefully be very successful in the long run, we have to figure out how we're going to increase capacity. So the answer is obvious, to me at least. Despite being completely unqualified to do so, I will design a new train for these lines. And of course, I'm going to tell you all about it. All of this work is going on as part of the RM Transit Suboptimal Vehicle Optimization Company Limited, the world's newest rolling stock company. Come along. Trams are really cool, but they're probably best left on the surface for the most part. That so many different cities choose to put trams in tunnels or other grade separated corridors is unfortunate, but it does make for a great video topic. Could we design a better train for these lines to operate when the capacity requires it? Now, you might imagine something like this already exists in Europe or Asia, but the reality is it really doesn't. And that's probably because most of the world wouldn't build a subway line that uses trams. Of course, in the case that it did, in most other places in the world, the cost of building transit isn't so incredibly high that building a new relief line would be fathomable. Now, this is particularly relevant with a system like Toronto's Eglinton Crosstown, which has massive, beautiful subway style stations with tons of capacity, except for the trains. Oh, and by the way, if you enjoy videos like this, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. I'm slowing down a bit on videos, and with your support, I can bring you higher quality content on a regular basis, while keeping the critical flow of public transit content flowing. Check out the link in the video description. Now, I do have to say that I was fairly inspired for this video. The S-TOG isn't really low floor, and it also isn't really a metro. But what it does do is give credence to the idea that with a sufficiently large system, there is justification to design a semi-custom piece of rolling stock that could actually be really good. There's also the point to be made that if 100 meter platforms or 90 meter platforms are a lot for a metro, as I've suggested with the Ontario line, then there's no reason they couldn't be a lot for a low floor train if we could design it in such a way that it was sufficiently high capacity. The issue is today's trains just aren't suitable. What do I mean though by suitable? Now, depending on how deep down the rabbit hole you've gone, I've made a lot of videos talking about why light rail vehicles, while attractive and comfortable for some services, aren't really conducive to a high capacity metro style operation. And that's an important consideration because cities of over a million, Ottawa and Seattle, have made low floor light rail lines the main public transit trunk in their cities. The issues with combining what are essentially trams into longer trains for subway style operation are really multifaceted. But the first one worth pointing out is that there's often a lot of dead space wasted by the cabs on the trains. In Seattle, for example, a four car long train has six cabs that go totally unused, not to mention the space between the cab on one tram and the cab on the next. Now, it is the case that some cities like Portland and Toronto sort of try to solve this issue by ordering trams that have cabs on one end and more seating on the other end, but if you're doing that, you might as well just create one bigger vehicle. Now, to be fair, one of the reasons that this hasn't happened historically is at least supposedly because operationally, it's easier to have smaller units. If a car crashes into your light rail train, which is possible since a lot of these systems do operate for at least part of their routes at grade, it's a lot less good to have a giant train, which makes up a lot more of your fleet broken and out of service than having one train damage that can be separated out and maintained separately. Another issue is the bogies. In a design like those used on Seattle's trains, you either have an unpowered bogey in the central section of the LRV, or you have an inaccessible elevated section above the bogey where you need to take several steps to get up to it. The lines in Ontario use 100% low floor vehicles, but these come with their own challenges. Notably, the bogies incur into the space in the cabin, which means less standing room replaced with awkwardly spaced seats and a narrow passageway that isn't super accessible. Now, these bogies do actually create other problems as well. Since light rail vehicles often have fewer of them per unit train length, and because light rail vehicles are heavy because of their complexity and structural integrity needed to be able to withstand getting hit with, say, a bus, the weight per bogey is quite high. And what this means is that more track maintenance is needed for systems that use low floor trains like this. And that's not to mention maintenance on the vehicles themselves being more complicated because of the tight working environment. 
The final issue I see is all about the doors. You see, the doors have a few issues. First of all, most light rail vehicles just don't have enough of them to operate in a metro style service. Some vehicles do make up for this by putting a lot of doors in certain sections of the vehicle, such as in Seattle. But the issue with this is not only do you get smaller doors, at the same time, the type of plug doors so often used on light rail systems, not all, but many, are quite mechanically complex, they typically can't close super fast, and they're really not the strongest, so they can be forced open and potentially damaged by heavy loads. That said, using pocket doors, as you often see on subway trains, is unattractive because light rail vehicles are relatively small. They don't have a lot of space to work with. At the same time, with a plug-style door, the doors themselves can come out of the vehicle's body and overlap with the articulating section, something you can't do with pocket-style doors. Now, coming around to designing our new train, the first thing I think needs to be a huge priority is more standing room. I'm completely aware that on some longer routes, more seating is useful, and there's no reason not to use traditional LRVs on these routes. But for urban routes or for extra frequency through a core section of a system, having more standing space is just logical. Now, if we imagine the Flexity Freedom LRV, we can get rid of the wasteful intermediate cabs and dead spaces on the vehicles, turning it into one giant, mini-segment long light rail tram. Imagine the Combino Supra or one of the CAF Urbos trams in Budapest, but even longer. Now, the flimsy doors are another problem. I thought initially about adding pocket doors, but that creates a problem. Even if you do have space for them, which you may not, that would possibly mean removing some windows, which isn't ideal. People do like sunlight and all. A good alternative to this are external sliding doors, as seen on systems like the MTR. These should work really well. They don't seal as nicely as pocket doors or as plug style doors, but they also take up less space than pocket style doors while being a lot more reliable and fast closing than plug style doors. Of course, the doors could also be wider than you typically see on current LRVs. I'm actually coming around to the idea that this may not be optimal. Two smaller doors may actually be worse than one big one, and so what I would suggest is putting one big external sliding door set on each intermediate segment. This should solve most of our door problems, at least the quality ones. Quantity is another problem. Now I actually think it may be possible to solve the weight spreading issue and door quantity issue at the same time. If there was a way we could get rid of the bowies on the alternating segments of the vehicle, that would free up a lot of additional space for standees and more longitudinal seating. Now, all of this sounds great, but the question is, where do you actually put the wheels? This is where I once again feel inspired by Copenhagen. While it would be tight and definitely mechanically complex, I think it would be possible to distribute wheels along every single segment of the tram. Instead of having bogies on the alternating segments, we would have four wheels in the corners of every individual segment. Again, this is rather unconventional, but it is akin to what Copenhagen does with its S-Tog trains, having only one axle on most of the carriages. These wheels likely wouldn't be connected to a single axle, which again, would be complicated, but this is the price of designing a really high capacity, low floor train. Now, fitting in motors is legitimately a possible issue, but fortunately, longitudinal seating adjacent to the doors in each segment should give us lots of room to work with underneath the seats. Now, in any case, having more vehicles of this style would likely increase the mechanical complexity and the amount of maintenance you needed to do on vehicles. But this is a price that we're probably going to be willing to accept if we need the capacity. At the same time, acquiring more vehicles for more capacity is a pretty normal thing anyways. In this case, we'd probably just need a little extra for extra maintenance downtime. With all of the design decisions out of the way, I give you the RM Transit High Capacity Low Floor Metro Train. Well, a traditional triple consist of Flexity Freedoms would give you nine double doors per side, the RHC LFMT would give you 14. And these doors would be larger, faster to open, and much sturdier. At the same time, the weight of the train could be distributed across 40% more wheels, reducing wear and tear on the fixed infrastructure along the line. Since the bogies would be taking up less useful space inside the cabin of the vehicle itself, more space would be available for standees as well as for longitudinal seating and accessibility spaces, which could be made with flip-up seating directly adjacent to the new wide doors. Overall, I think the design of the RHC LFMT could increase capacity per vehicle by as much as 25%, and I definitely don't think it's out of the question that frequency could also be increased by a minimum of 25% with this many larger additional doors. Now, I'm sure there are more design ideas which could be incorporated into a low floor metro train. So I'm curious what you think in the comments down below. Thanks for coming along to look at our first rolling stock design, and as always, thanks for watching.